you know, our, our existing investment priorities since we were created in 2002 has been to invest in early childhood development, uh, child abuse prevention and intervention, uh, after school and mentoring programs. But last November, we did add a fifth area to the ballot measure. And I'm pleased to say, with overwhelming voter support, uh, we now have a fifth investment area, and that is investing, as I said, in programs that will help children in foster care succeed. I know we, certainly all of you in the audience know what a pressing priority it is to have programs provide more services for children in foster care or who have aged out of foster care, to be precise. And so we're very excited today to be uh, making the decisions today on how to invest some $5 million over the next three years in proven programs that will do exactly that, help children in foster care succeed. So uh, before I get started any further, uh, I want to say that we do have an important scheduling change. Uh, we are postponing decisions on child abuse prevention and intervention uh, from today, where it was previously scheduled, until our next meeting on June 9th. Uh, so that we will, uh, it will be coupled with our decisions on early childhood uh, applications. Uh, we made this change because the challenge to making funding decisions for these uh, two areas in separate meetings uh, was seen as problematic, and we felt that it was better to make those decisions in both those areas at the same meeting, early childhood and well as child abuse prevention and intervention. So I hope none of you are here for the wrong meeting, but. If not, we'll see you a week from tomorrow. And uh, I want to introduce, uh, thank you all. I want to, first of all, thank all the organizations who did submit requests for investments. Uh, we appreciate the effort you took in, create, in crafting your application and becoming part of this process. We understand the great need in Portland for children's programs, as evident by the number of applications we received, uh, 126 in all totaling more than $97 million for three years' worth of funding. Uh, we have about $37 million to invest over that same period of time. So as you can see, we have to make some tough and difficult decisions. For those of you who will not receive Children's Investment Fund investments today, I do want to applaud, applaud your endeavors and the valuable work you do with Portland's youth. And I think I speak for the entire Allocation Committee and the staff of the Children's Investment Fund, when I wish you the best of luck with your programs in the future. So I'd like to now introduce the, uh, my colleagues on the Allocation Committee. Uh, on my far right is Alyssa Kinney Geyer. Next to me is Adrian Livingston. Uh, on my far left is Ron Belts. And next to me is Multnomah County Chair Ted Wheeler. Uh, moving on to the Investment Fund staff, uh, Program Director Lisa Pellegrino is back in the shadows this time. Uh, she oversees uh, both the after-school and mentoring program, so she was in the hot seat at our meeting uh, oh, two weeks ago. Uh, Assistant, Director, Assistant Director Meg McElroy, who oversees early childhood programs. She'll be in the hot seat next week. Uh, Lisa Hansel, who oversees child abuse prevention and intervention and foster care. She'll be in the hot seat today and next week. <laughs> and uh, Communications Director Mary Gay Broderick, who's always in the hot seat. I keep her, keep her on her toes. And then our fiscal specialist, John Kelly, who's over there today. Okay. And John Kelly did a great job last week, and he's going to do a great one today with an Excel spreadsheet so we can really keep precise track of how we're investing the money. Uh, again, just some quick background on the Children's Investment Fund. Uh, as I said earlier, it was passed by Portland voters in 2002. Uh, they passed the Children's Levy, which created the fund. Uh, as I said, the levy was again renewed overwhelmingly last November for another five years. And annually invest in, and annually invest in programs that reach more than 16,000 of Portland's children uh, through 66 programs, as I said, in early childhood, after school and mentoring, child abuse prevention and intervention, and then starting today, helping children in foster care succeed. A 5% administrative cap means that 95% of the levy goes directly to proven programs that achieve positive results for children while a leverage fund that partners public funds with private dollars has generated more than $6 million to date for Portland's children. So let's begin by asking for approval of the minutes of our May 18th meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. 
And then before we begin discussing our funding slates, uh, Lisa Pellegrino has a short presentation on the CHIF funding process and how we got to this point today. Good afternoon, everybody. We'll make this brief, but I want to give everybody um, a quick chance to see how do we get to this point, how do we get here today, uh, what happened before, um, for those who have not been with us for the entire process. Um, all right, I'll do both at the same time here. Um, so this was started, we really began planning for the RFI process back um, uh, more than a year ago now um, to consider how to go about doing this. Um, and we looked at uh, both how the money should be allocated across all the funding areas, um, how we should modify the request for investment, whether we should compete the funding again, or whether current grantees should simply be renewed. Um, and then we thought we would go out for public input. So we were thinking about designing that process to, to get input on all these questions um, from the public um, ahead of time. Um, so we identified um, a number of key stakeholders, including both sort of policy groups, folks who work in these areas, uh, like in this round, for instance, DHS or um, groups uh, that, that come together to meet about child abuse systems, as well as general public meetings, so all providers and all community members um, open to come and give their input. Um, and we asked questions about all those policy issues that we just that I just named. Um, and so we had a number of common themes, um, and one of, two of the most sort of predominant were that we needed to fund more services, or there was a need for more services in East Portland um, that came through loud and clear, as well as a need for culturally specific services. Um, so those were kind of the two biggest themes that we tried to carry forward um, to the RFI, um, and in fact included extra points for both of those. Um, if, if applications addressed those uh, key issues, um, they were eligible to receive extra points. Um, the allocation committee in the winter um, of 08, 09, well, I guess, yes, it was this past winter, um, then came together to decide how to divide up the funds and how to issue the RFP. Um, and the funds were pretty much divided up more or less as that we gathered a lot of public input on that and thought how, sh you know, ask people how we should divide those up. And this is pretty much in line with what folks said, which was the allocation committee taking its cue from kind of the general public. Um, uh, and they also decided to require that everybody come forward and compete, which is why we're here today with both current grantees and new, well, mostly new applicants in this funding area, um, competing for funding. Um, the committee also, uh, as Dan mentioned earlier, decided to set aside money again for a leverage fund. Um, so those decisions won't be coming up for a while yet. We're finishing competitive process first. Um, but in the fall, we should probably head into that arena. Um, and then last, uh, you all made decisions about the, the RFP and what it should look like, what the content should be, and uh, what the process should be. Um, so from there, we issued requests for investment in all of our funding areas, including foster care, the one we're going to review today. Uh, we held bidders conferences to try to help people fill out the application accurately and do a good job. Uh, we recruited a lot of grant reviewers, many, many grant reviewers, all of whom we're going to thank right here today publicly for putting in their time. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, oriented them to doing the process. And then staff met with each and every group of reviewers uh, to discuss the final scores for the applications. And then the scores were then uh, between the three reviewers for every set of applications averaged um, and put into a score sheet, which was then provided to the allocation committee, amongst other things, um, to help you all make your decisions. Um, along with the scores, staff also provided um, kind of a, a quick data sheet that described, gave the basics on all the applications, as well as more detailed summaries that um, summarized what the service was to, that was to be provided, as well as uh, any issues with past performance or any other uh, concerns staff or reviewers had, as well as any positive points that staff or reviewers noted. Um, so that was all provided to the committee to help you all make your decisions. Um, and then we distributed, uh, as well as staff recommendations, staff provided recommendations to the committee on what should be funded and what the reasons for that were, what the rationales for that were. Um, and then we asked the committee to, to send us slates of the applicants that they wanted to fund and in what amounts. Um, and then today we're going to be beginning from that point um, uh, today of looking at all the sites together, uh, aggregated information. Who, you know, do we, where is the points? Of, where are the points of most agreement? And be kind of beginning there. So just in terms of the audience who's watching, I think this is new for a lot of people because we've not funded in this area. Um, we'll be starting from points of agreement among the committee on what ought to be funded, and then discussing kind of down the list from there. Um, so where all five people agree that they want to fund some. Something, it may be even in the same amount, that will be one of the first applications taken up um, to make preliminary decisions. And then after those preliminary decisions um, are made, we'll take time for public comment and then final decisions today. 
So this is just the last slide, just to let people know that, as Dan said, June 9th, we're going to do child abuse prevention intervention in early childhood. Um, after that, there'll be contract negotiations um, with contract terms beginning on July 1st for the new funding. So that's kind of where we've been from here and where we intend to go today. And at this point, I'll hand it over to Lisa Hansel, who's going to be facilitating the discussion today. Uh, thank you, Lisa. And um, it's clear that there's been a lot of great work done by our uh, reviewers. I want to echo the thanks for the, uh, all the people that took time to review applications and to score them. And um, I also want to take this time to also mention that while we appreciate the scores and the time that our reviewers invested in these proposals, uh, the score is just one indicator by which the allocation committee makes decisions. Uh, one of those, in, another indicator is, is simply the discretion of this committee. So there were a lot of variables that are going to enter in today's, to say, today's discussion. Uh, and I just want to reiterate, as I did the last meeting, that the, the score is, is simply one, one thing that we use in the decisions. And can uh, I add to that? Yes, I, I just want to reinforce what you said, because we've said that at almost every meeting, and then there was still a concern at the end of the last meeting about it. Mm -hmm. So it's one score, but the score is based on how well the proposal meets the RFP criteria. So this, the reviewers went through each application and dissected it and looked at what the RFP asked for and how well does the proposal match that. So when you see a score, it doesn't mean how good is this organization or whether we should fund it or not. It means how well does, is, does, the, RF, does the proposal fit the RFP. So when... when um, Commissioner Sal what Commissioner Salzman um, talks about the, our discretion, it's because we need to look at what is the range of services and make sure that we have that range um, across the city, across age groups, uh, et cetera. So we really look at need. So while we appreciate the review um, and not only the score, but especially the comments that the reviewers did, um, there are cases where we'll take something that the proposal scored lower, but because of the need that we see in the city or the reputation we know that, that that group has or the past work that they've done in this area, we may be bumping it up. I'm sorry, I Thanks. feel like I need that, to underscore uh, that every time. I think you did a great job of underscoring that. And then the, the final thing before I turn it over to Lisa Hansel is uh, we are a, a public body, and uh, I know many of you probably uh, submit foundations to or grants to foundations all the time. And uh, you basically learn what the decision is of the foundation, and that's about it. Because we're a public body, we have to discuss our decisions in public, on TV, in front of you. And we, do, we probably will have questions for many of you who, who have written uh, requests for investment. Some of those may be rather pointed. So I just want to uh, say that uh, this is something we do because we are a public body and we do it in the public arena. So now I'm going to uh, turn it over to Lisa Hansel to keep us going here. Thank you. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, we have close to $5 million to invest in the foster care program area, and that amount is for a three-year funding period. We received 18 applications requesting to be considered within this funding area, with the total request amount just under $15 million. Before we move into the funding decisions, um, an allocation committee member has requested that a discussion take place regarding the Emanuel Children's Hospital application prior to making the preliminary funding decisions. Uh, we feel this discussion is necessary because um, the outcome of the discussion will impact the funding levels for other proposals. Um, allocation committee members, re reviewers, and staff all had questions regarding whether and to what extent the medical services proposed are already covered by Oregon Health Plan or, or other sources. The applicant proposes to serve 100 foster care children ages 0 to 18 each year with services that follow the American Academy of Pediatrics Resource Manual, Fostering Health, Health Care for Children and Adolescents in Foster Care. These services include health information gathering at the time of removal, initial medical screening, comprehensive medical and developmental assessment, routine preventive health care, coordination of health care services, follow-up on treatment recommendations, full mental health assessments, and medication management. I'd like to ask a representative from Emanuel and a representative from DHS to join us at the table at this time to have a further discussion about this. 
Welcome. So um, if you could just each introduce yourself first. Kelly Kennedy. Kelly? Yes. Okay. With? I'm with the Legacy Emanuel. Okay. Alicia Hahn from DHS. Thank you. Okay. Um, do I can start with some staff questions and then invite okay. the allocation committee to jump in, or that sounds good does that me. work for you? That work for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, first, um, a question for you, Alicia. Um, what is DHS's responsibility for medical care services for children in foster care? Uh, as soon as the children come into care, they're can you pull the microphone. Down? Sorry. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, when the children enter foster care, they're enrolled. Um, in uh, the Oregon Health Plan, if they're eligible, um, most of the children are. Um, and through that plan, all of their um, emergent and preventive care is covered, their immunizations, um, mental health assessments, uh, treatment if needed, their dental care, uh, they're all covered under the OHP. Um, and then everyone, all of our kids get medical cards, so it's covered underneath that, the prescriptions. So. Okay, so Kelly, a question for you. Um, how do the services that are proposed in the application differ from the services that are covered through um, OHP for foster children? The medical services would be covered through the OHP uh, funding for the time that the child spends with the physician. What would not be covered and what we're proposing is time for medical social workers who can handle case management for these children because they often have multiple and very complex medical and behavioral needs that are not covered by one primary care physician. And so what we're proposing is um, funding the medical social workers who can help to coordinate care amongst various specialties as well as the mental health providers and also be a support to the foster care parent um, for mental health resources um, for them as well. And so we're looking at covering costs that are not included in the OHP funding but that we feel is needed for comprehensive care of these somewhat complex kids. And for those, the other services, um, are those services that are not reimbursable through OHP? The medical social work services are not a, a function that is reimbursed. So the specialty care that they would receive being referred to other physicians would be covered, but not the coordination of the services and the referrals that need to occur to get the children to the specialists that they need to see. Do allocation committee members have questions? So uh, you, you've done a very good job of, of illustrating what is and what is not reimbursable, but I guess my question is more fundamental uh, on two levels. Uh, first of all, even though it's not reimbursable, isn't that the role of DHS to provide that coordination? We, the caseworkers do a lot of that now in conjunction with um, the providers and the whoever is providing the care, relative caregivers, or their foster parents. So um, referrals into specialists, those kinds of things, mental health, um, referring kids to appropriate mental health treatment, all of that is done usually through the caseworker. And, and statutorily, isn't that your requirement? Yes. yes. And so I, I guess you know, my concern is more of a philosophical one than a practical one. Uh, and I, I applaud what you're trying to do, and I think uh, you know, there are some issues with coordination, particularly around medical services. My concern is, you know, we're, you know, Commissioner Saltzman, I thought, made a really good distinction between this body and a foundation. And there's a second important distinction, which is we're funded by taxpayer dollars from this local jurisdiction. And they're already paying taxes for what you're statutorily required to provide. And my question is, is, is it an appropriate use of these limited tax dollars when we have so many pressing needs to effectively backfill with what is a mandated function at the state level and for which we're already paying taxes? Um, I, I think that's, this is time probably for the committee to have its discussion. Um, you know, I believe that, well, Chair Wheeler makes, makes a good point. I think 
the point of our decisions today are to really decide how to help children in foster care succeed. Uh, and while much of this proposal may, in theory, be the responsibility of, of DHS, I think that this proposal provides a strong focal point for serving the needs of, of children in foster care. Uh, I point out it had a very high score. It's designed or identified as a best practice by the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, also addresses a longstanding uh, concern of the Multnomah County child abuse uh, multidisciplinary team, uh, which uh, has been a longstanding body of uh, who I have much respect for. Uh, who work on issues that I think they helped design CARES Northwest, they helped design the Children's Receiving Center, and many other aspects that I think have been important, uh, particularly to children in, in the system. And I think this, this is more than just about funding health insurance. It's more about, as I said, getting the attention and, and having the resources there to serve at least 100 kids a year with comprehensive mental health needs uh, and having a, a, point, a place they can call home. Uh, which I think is what the Emanuel Children's Clinic is proposing that it become. Um, I know there was, you know, two reviewers did score this very highly. Uh, one did question, I think, along the lines of what Chair Wheeler's questions are. Uh, so I think we should, should weigh that. But um, I think that, you know, Legacy, Emanuel, Cares Northwest, others have a long established tradition, sometimes unfortunately so, as, as sort of the gateway for many kids into the healthcare system. I mean, it's because Legacy is a trauma hospital, it's because it's an emergency room that uh, receives a disproportionate number of cases of children in crisis uh, that they ultimately reside, that they ultimately have sort of a, a next step up, a transition through a, a clinic like this, I think is a proposal that I am supporting at the recommendation of the, of the staff, not not the full amount requested, but I believe staff recommended about 800,000 out of a million. And, and I think this is, because it is a best practice, because it enjoys the support of, of those who I respect in this community, I, that I, I'm comfortable going with 800,000. But I know there's a disparity on this committee, which is why we started with this proposal. And this is a good point for others to to weigh in. Um, well, I'm trying to see. I came in in my slate in the middle ground, and so I'm still in the middle ground right now. Um, there was a philosophical issue about what we should be funding, and also this particular application resulted in the widest range of recommended funding levels by about 800000 which is why we really needed to tackle this up front so we know whether the rest of us would be scaling back or increasing other recommendations. Um, I, I uh, had originally looked at some of the direct services. I know you have um, pediatrician FTE in here. Um, some of the things that I thought would be covered by OHP, um, preventative and urgent medical care, I'm not sure about assessments, you know, which of those things, you have a whole list of things here, uh, behavioral health assessment, collaborative problem solving, preventative and urgent medical care, medication management, behavioral health consults. So what I was trying to figure out is which uh, of those things would be covered by OHP, which of those things, as, as um, Ted Wheeler said, would be covered by what DHS should be doing, and then are there other things left over? If we were to go a middle ground with a grant, are there, is there a role for DHS is performing the case management from your side, but from the medical side, is there a role that, that a medical institution could play that would help foster kids and that might be a pilot in the future? <clears throat> Which of the pieces would be the most appropriate ones that OHP and um, Medicaid and DHS would not be picking up? I'm, I'm trying to zero in on those pieces that currently are left out of the system and, and perhaps are not mandated within the system but really need to be in place. From our experience, like like I stated before, the, the medical costs of the child seeing the physician are covered under the OHP plan. Um, the coordination of that care is not, and the collaborative problem solving for the foster care parents with our mental health specialists is not a covered service. So we really feel like to provide holistic care for our kids, we need to include the mental health and behavioral piece as well as their medical care. And while we can provide the preventive 
immunizations, well checkups, and, and medical services, we're missing a big piece of what we see as very important for these children in particular who are at risk and who often have not regularly benefited from the care of physicians and medical providers. And so we feel that the mental health and coordination of care to really model a medical home for these children where they can be seen not only throughout the time that they spend in foster care, but when they return to their families or transition out of foster care, that we would continue to be the coordinators for that whole body care for the child, the mental health, behavioral, as well as the um, medical piece, and, and that is not covered by the OHP, the coordination, especially at those services. So if you were to receive partial funding, would you lower the number of children served from 100 down to a certain level and still include all these services, or are there ones that you think could be covered by other entities in the community and you would cut out some of the services that you're proposing to offer in order to serve more kids? I think that we are very committed to providing the whole range of services to these children because mm -hmm. taking one or two out doesn't help us reach the goal that we have for these kids of providing the whole model of care for them. So I think we would continue to be committed to providing the services, whether that means having to reduce the number of children per year that we can serve or looking elsewhere for some funding to make up that gap. I don't believe we would cut the services. I think we would have to look at at how many children we could still cover with the full range of services. Other questions? <laughs> so a medical home, I guess that was the, the term I've heard referred to by the child abuse multidisciplinary team and, and the pediatrics. I mean, it's, it's about having baseline assessments. It's about having a consistent place where records are in addition to providing expanded services. Correct. We really want to be the, the care provider throughout the child's childhood um, until they transition into a, adult care. So whether that be only with the foster parent or whether that be when they transition out of foster care, either back to a parent or into another service, we really see it as a constant for them, that they know who their primary care provider is. And regardless of where they're physically living, they can come to us for that coordination of their services for familiar providers and for their medical records so that what we experience currently is children who move throughout the foster care system often we receive them through the emergency room oftentimes with no medical records and we really don't know any of their background and what we're striving to do is provide a home for not only the child but their records so that as they transition to other places, their providers and care providers will know where to come for that information, and there will be a consistent place for them to receive care and or to at least receive their medical records should they be leaving the area. Sure. This seems like a bit of a role reversal, because in effect, then, won't you be taking the lead role and DH will be subordinate to what you're doing? In effect, you'll be case managing the case managers, won't you? I think there would be a strong collaboration. We already collaborate very well with DHS um, to get the children in, but I think what we're offering is just a more expanded model of the medical home model within our facility while still continuing to collaborate with their DHS caseworkers. We see a very important role there for DHS, and I think we want to support that role and be able to expand what is currently offered to these children. Let, let me ask the flip question of DHS. Is, is that how you see your role? Do you, uh, 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 and, and I realize I sound really callous when I'm talking dollars and cents when we are, in fact, talking about some of the neediest kids in our community. Uh, so I want to acknowledge I'm sticking my neck way out here. Uh, but I think it's a really important question. It's what I really want to drive, and I, I, I just want to put this out there. I want to drive reform in DHS, particularly in the Children's Services Division. And my concern is we keep making it easier for you not to do that. Uh, and what I don't want to have happen is have this local community continue to step up with its own tax dollars to support something that we're already paying for and collaboration and coordination that we already expect in this community. And I'm, I'm not talking to you specifically, so understand, I love you. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> Um, but it, you know, what, what do you see as the real role in this kind of relationship over the long term? Well, right now, DHS is providing this. I mean, 
we have kid, the kids coming into care are referred for their medical and dental referrals right, right away. Within that, the referrals have to be done within 30 days. Their mental health referral has to be out within 60 days. I mean, we're doing it. It's not like we're not. What if this was funded? Um, I and, and I'm trying to envision it because I did not read this proposal. So this is kind of the first information I have on it. It's like I am envisioning that the children would be referred into this program where they would get this comprehensive assessment. And it would not take away our responsibility for providing that. It's that this would be a, a very good program to refer the children into and then have a central place for all their medical care and their um, um, medical records. Thank you. I appreciate it. If there's no further questions of Alicia and Kelly, you, you're welcome to take your seats and, and thank you. We'll thank continue. You. Thank you. Thank you both. So uh, we are. We have decided to start with this. Um, why don't you, uh, Lisa, just briefly describe uh, the full amount requested was I think a, a little over a million. And you rec the staff recommended, I think, 818. Just you want to just outline your rationale on 813. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, well, many of the same reasons that um, Commissioner Saltzman outlined. Um, staff rationale for recommending funding on this application was that it was a high scoring application. Um, the applicant in the states that they've worked closely with DHS. Um, the DHS health assessment coordinator in putting this proposal together and that they saw it as a valuable supportive resource for children in foster care. Um, also, I weighted heavily the um, input from the Multnomah County Child Abuse Multidisciplinary Team and how this proposal addressed gaps in service for children in foster care. I, too, hold high regard for the uh, multidisciplinary team. Um, also that this, the proposed program follows best practice guidelines. Also that the services fit with in the RFI that we published um, in that it helps children in foster care succeed and they are proposing direct services for foster children. Um, so those were primarily my reasons for recommending it for funding, but I did have the question isn't this something that DHS already is responsible for, the medical care of children? And that's why it was important to get that question out and for the committee to have a discussion. This is a new funding area for Children's Investment Fund. What are the appropriate services that, um, that should be funded with this area? So I appreciate Ted Wheeler's um, concerns, raising the concerns about is this an appropriate role for CHIF to play? in the foster care arena. Um, Thanks. Well, um, I guess it's time to have some discussion. I think, you know, Chair Wheeler raises some good points, but I think, you know, much of the Children's Investment Fund is premised on the notion that we're going to do things that in, in theory might be state responsibility, could be federal responsibility, but the reason we ask voters to uh, establish $15 million a year to invest in, in these proven programs. I think much of it does, in fact, uh, provide services perhaps where others should but can't due to the very fiscal realities, and the county is certainly in that situation too. Uh, I do once again believe that because of the endorsements this has from the Child Abuse Interdis Multidisciplinary Team and the American Association of Pediatrics, uh, and I do think this fits with our mission of helping children in foster care succeed. I would like to see it funded at the staff level of 813000 right? So if I could just interject for a second, because I don't know if you want to make the preliminary decision at this point or if you want to move in the order of highest, rec highest agreement and then down the list. Um, you know, I'm com if you feel like you need to make a preliminary decision before moving on, I'm fine with that, but just want to question. Bring that question to I thought that's what you wanted us to do was to get this one well, out. Well, to of the hear way. the so, okay. 
Yeah, let's do it. Let's rip the band aid off. One. Okay. Yeah, this, this okay. is the hard I, I did have a question. I, uh, Alyssa seemed to come down on some middle ground here uh, at uh, about 360,000. I'm, I'm wondering if you, you know, could maybe elaborate on, on your thinking. Um, well, I kind of put a number in here because I wanted to have the discussion before I saw what other people were doing. And I was concerned uh, about duplication with DHS, so I really take that to heart, what you said. I do think that um, providing a medical home is something that's happening um, across the country for the general population as well as um, this very needy population. So I'm very supportive of that concept. I just want to make sure that, again, we're not backfilling and when, when we look at the recommendations that have come out of the Citizens Crime Commission, the panel that, that were made up of people from the courts, foster care, et cetera, the multidisciplinary task force, the recommendation is that so those services be in place, not necessarily that they get delivered in a certain way or funded in a certain way. So we need to see that as a fabric of the community. And so what I'm struggling with is to what extent should DHS be providing those services to what extent should OHP be providing the very high care? Because there are very high costs to a lot of these. When it was broken down in the budget, there's 3.1 FTE for pediatricians, et cetera. So how much of that can get covered? I guess what I was, and part of it, frankly, was wanting to make sure that funds went to other programs in the community that were addressing other issues. And so that's where I ended up somewhere in the middle, and, and uh, I'm not attached to that particular number. I guess what I would like to see is, Something in there, if, if there really is a need for a medical community to step up and be a, a player here, something in there that um, either they offer the whole range and they try to get reimbursed for as much as possible and they, and they serve as many kids with what, whatever they can get reimbursed and whatever we can, we can pay them, um, and it's a pilot. And I'm not sure that I'm as confident about doing it to the degree of 813,000, because it's a big chunk away from all the other things that we're going to be hearing about next. So well, it, that was it, my middle ground. And, and thank you. And if I may, and I, I thought the representative did a very good job where, wherever she went. I, I lost track of her, but I thought she did a very good job of articulating uh, the added value of this program. And I think it came across, in my mind, uh, somewhat stronger than the application, just reading the application itself. So I'm glad that we have this forum to actually ask uh, as Commissioner Saltzman said, the pointed questions. Uh, I notice Adrian and you are fairly close in terms of your funding. Uh, I would be willing to join you uh, in the interest of reaching a consensus because I think we have a philosophical agreement that we're nervous about uh, funding a duplicative service or even one that's potentially mandated, but we see the added value of the medical home concept, and I certainly see that as well. Okay, well... Um I know both Ron and I recommended the staff level. Sounds like Chair Wheeler is coming in somewhere in the 350 to 400,000, which is consistent, I think, with your recommendations. I guess I'll toss out 400,000 for 400,000 for the initial placeholder for Emanuel Children's Hospital. Okay. Or do you see yourself going up for 400? <laughs> no, that's fine. I, I agree. I think that's a good. Okay. Okay, so we're ready to move on? Okay. So we made our first decision. Oh, you've got the spreadsheet up there. Okay, great. That was a good meeting. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> sure, come on up, Kelly. It sounded like there was concern about the pediatrician FTE in this, mm -hmm. and this proposal actually did not include any funding for the pediatrician. There's a very small piece for the medical director of the program, but mm. not for the pediatricians themselves. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I guess we started out where we had probably maybe the most differences. Now we'll start where we have more uh, more in common in our Points recommendations. Points of agreement. Points of agreement. Correct. Right. So we'll um, start off with um, we have two funding proposal or two proposals that all five of you agreed um, to with recommending to fund and as well as the funding level. Um, so the first is Boys and Girls Aid, Wendy's Wonderful Kids. And I'll just give a brief description of each of the programs. Um, this program works to move the most difficult to place children from foster care to permanent adoptive homes. 
and is part of a national program model serving children ages 0 to 18. They project um, serving 15 children each year and placing 30 children in adoptive homes over the three-year funding period. And um, children are referred to this program directly from DHS caseworkers. Um, the requested amount for this program was $109,556 over a three-year period, and um, each of the allocation committee members have um, submitted that amount on their funding slates. Any discussion, or is everyone still clear on moving forward with that funding amount? Looks good. Looks like we're good. Okay. Um, the second... The second program that also all three of you, or all five of you, agreed um, should be funded at the level of $562,952 is Juvenile Rights Project. Um, this is a program that has been previously funded by the Children's Investment Fund through a leveraged fund contract. Uh, the program provides legal representation, other advocacy and case management activities in an effort to improve school stability and academic success of children in foster care. They serve children ages or in grades kindergarten through 12, anticipate serving 232 children per year, and are referred by juvenile rights project attorneys who are, in, or who are appointed to represent them in juvenile court. Any discussion? Seen... I, I just have a comment. I really like right. this program. Uh, th th this is one that I'm, I'm very pleased to see that we're all in agreement on. It got to the suspension and expulsion uh, issue, which is an important one. It also links clearly with the juvenile justice system, uh, which is an important aspect uh, of the overall discussion, and it focuses on high school completion. So it, in my mind, it targets a number of the underlying indicator issues, a number of the core problems that we address as we're looking to reform and improve the foster care system. So I'm, I was pleased to see that, that everybody here reached the same conclusion. Uh, before we go any further, I forgot to mention in the opening remarks that we will take public testimony once we've reached a draft slate for funding, slate of programs, and then we will, after the public testimony, we'll actually vote on the final recommendation for funding. Thank you, and I, and I should have said that. Also, another reminder is if you do have questions of other applicants as we move through before you make a preliminary funding decision, please um, ask to call them up, as well as DHS representatives are here, um, Alicia, as well as some others. So if you do have questions from DHS perspective, um, feel free to ask those as well. Um, and I do want to point out there actually weren't five. There was um, one allocation committee member um, had indicated a slightly higher amount of 562,952, and the rest were 562,643. So, um, 643, does that work for everybody? Okay. Um, now we move down to where um, all five allocation committee members agree to fund at some level, um, but the levels differ, and there's a range between so, 407. Excuse me. Excuse me. On SEI, I'm in agreement with two others. I didn't have that, but um, the next. You, but I, I, don't know what, I am in agreement at the 750 range. If you want to put that as three agreeing. With Ted and Adrian. Okay, so, okay, actually, the next one that um, that is considered on this list is the Janus Insights Echo, but I will um, move the SEI into that category as well, so there will be three. We have four applications that all now have three allocation committee members recommending the same funding level um, with all five application or allocation committee members some, recommending some level of funding. So. I'll start with the Janus Insights ECHO program. Um, this would be a new program designed to serve teen mothers and their children where either the teen parent or the child is in foster care. Services include home visiting, parent education, and some housing subsidies. Um, focus is also on families living east of 82nd um, with 60% of the clients from East County or East Portland. Um, services will be for teen moms ages 14 to 21 and their children ages 0 to 5. 
um, anticipating serving 50 teen moms and 60 of their children. And the primary referral source would be DHS Child Welfare. And the range in funding on this um, goes from 470,896 up to 523,218. So it's a pretty close range, but there still is a range. And so the, the 523 was the uh, amount of the request, and then the, the lesser amount was, I think, your recommendation citing sort of the lag and the need to expend and funds due to, due to startup costs. Correct. And also, again, uh, wanting to spread funding to as many programs as possible and seeing that there may be potential there for lower amount of funding in the startup phase. Well, the reason I came in with a higher amount is that um, almost all of these are startup, and so I didn't see that rationale on any of the others. I felt that um, it's really targeting so many of the things that we've highlighted, being able to target teens and children early on as they're developing their, their brains and their relationship and their bonding. Um, I think that's really important. I think there's statistics that show that teens that have children are likely to have more children, and so we have we've keep saying we want to keep uh, the numbers of kids falling into foster care down. Um, it serves over 50%, I think 60% in outer southeast, and so to me, this is one of the ones that really, um, and it scored highly, it, it was just very positive all the way around. And so that's why I put the full funding request amount. Other discussion? I think it's a great program, especially when you talk about breaking the cycle. Um, I did put the staff recommended amount, but it was also so that I can look at the different programs that are um, within this category to be able to fund other programs that are also needed. Um, but still having it at a high amount because I think it's maybe a little bit over less than fifty thousand um, uh, dollars from the the total amount that we're reducing it to um, and I just think it's 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 a great program i I see the need and definitely wanting to have the teen moms break out of that cycle and and not pass it down to their kids, but then just still looking at other programs other thoughts so um, other thoughts I mean we have three of us basically at the staff recommended level and two of us at the full amount. So I, I'm at the full amount for exactly the reasons that Alyssa pointed out. Um, I, I was concerned about the inconsistency in the logic from one proposal to the next. There were others that clearly uh, were also technically startups. Plus the Insight program has been around, hasn't it? So it, it's a new provider, but the program currently exists. The Insights program has been around, yes. Right, but right. these are new services that they're proposing Okay, well, it, it turns out it's a moot point because since I have supported uh, Emmanuel, I need to make up some on my slate. So I would go with the majority since I assume three rules anyway. So I, I will join okay. as a fourth. Okay, so the 478.96. Okay, um, the next application is Big Brothers Big Sisters Project Hope. And this is a program that is currently funded through the CHIF uh, Child Abuse Prevention Intervention Funding Area. They provide one-on-one -on -one mentoring, um, about 10 hours per month per child. And the focus is on youth living in East Portland and youth of color. Serve youth ages 6 to 19, living in or transitioning from foster care. Projects serving 183 youth each year, and referrals come from DHS families, foster families, and other child-serving agencies. The range in funding um, on the slates is from 350000 to 402952 And that 402 was the staff's recommendation, which was just extending the current program Big Brothers Big Sisters has for serving children in foster care plus cost of living adjustment and... And up to 15% up, admin up to recovery. 15% in Correct. cost recovery. Well, um, I was at the 350 level. Um, I think Big Brothers Big Sisters has a fabulous reputation. I think they do... A, we we um, awarded them in the mentoring section at the um, full amount that the staff had recommended. 
I had a few concerns on this one. One of them was that the supervisor overseeing the mentor matches was 70 to 90, the range of 70 to 90 to 1, which um, was the highest of any of the mentor proposals that came in and was of concern to me given the, the high need of this population. The um, other thing I was concerned about and you know, our range is so low, I don't know that it's worth having someone come up here, but if you think it is, then then I would invite them to come up. Um, the we evaluations... Have from the big brothers, big yes. The, the evaluation um, looks like the kind of evaluation, performance outcome evaluation that you use looks to be the same as you use for the general population. And so the outcomes that you were looking at were improved performance in school and things like that, all of which appear to be very good. Um, I want to make sure in this particular category, since this is a new category for us, that we're very clear about um, aligning our performance outcome expectations with the kinds of things that we've been hearing from panels like DHS. Like, are we um, helping permanency in foster, uh, foster care homes? Are we helping kids lead to a, a adoption or reunification with a family? Are we helping the dialogue between um, biological families and foster families. And that's not when you have kind of a uh, somewhat of a standalone, although I recognize there are a lot of strong partnerships in the community, but when you have a, a mentoring program that comes to us as a proposal as opposed to a part of Native American Youth Association or SEI or, or the other, you know, we saw mentoring as a component of other proposals. But I would want to make sure that we're really tracking to what degree those outcomes are tied to what we say we want to see in the foster care community. And, and that, I'm not sure, is happening. And I don't think it's been tracked in the past because we didn't have a foster care category. Um, okay. So. Would you like to hear, hear from sure. your brothers, big sisters? Lynn? Uh, so if you could uh, just give us your name. Hi, I'm Lynn Thompson, the CEO of Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Um, the first concern was about the um, staffing ratio. I think we're comparing apples to oranges here. We're highly specialized, and a lot of mentoring programs, there's one mentor, um, there's one person who supports all of the mentoring functions. We have different functions. One is the recruiter. The second are the folks that do the intake for both the children and the volunteers and the families or foster families. The third is a group of staff members who do the screening and also the interviews of the children and the foster parents, DHS workers, and all the background checks. Then they do the training and find out who would be matched well together, match them, and then they hand it off to match support specialists. So they're not doing anything else that in a lot of groups, they're doing those other functions. That we also have um, activity coordinators who plan all the group activities. Again, in a lot of agencies, that's done by the match support specialist, and we have specialists who do that. We also have specialists who do the data analysis and a lot of data input. So we just, um, you know, we have um, 45 full time staff working on this. And so it might seem like the ratio is high, but I think that probably the ratio of staff to kid is lower than in other programs. We're just counting it differently. Does that make sense? Yeah, and how does it compare to your other mentoring program for so at risk kids, but not yeah. kids that are in this much trauma? So usually they have a third fewer, um, their caseload is a third less. Mm -hmm. So um, this so that, is for 70 foster care. for foster care. So this is 70 to 90. So usually it's about 100 to 125. Mm -hmm. So it's typically a third less for this program. We also uh, have a staff member who specializes in the foster care program and does a lot of special activities around that, mm -hmm. who is not the match support specialist. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other one, we are not tracking some of the outcomes. We track 40 different outcomes on the developmental assets of youth. And we, um, one thing that we track is the strength of the relationship, which is very important for foster care youth. We found that um, the studies with control groups, like the seminal study on research that showed we keep kids off drugs, off alcohol, less likely to be violent, they pulled out a couple years later all of the foster care kids and just looked at them separately and said one of the um, 
most prominent outcomes where they trust adults more, which is huge in getting kids to be successful as adults themselves. So we are now starting to track that uh, relationship and trust more. In terms of permanency, we have a lot of antidotal information there. And um, Patricia, I could probably tell you, but I think we could look at tracking that. We have um, a lot of you know Chantel, who works here in Nick Fish's office, but she's... Um, she was in 34 foster homes before she got a big sister. And then, um, no, that was another girl that was in your pamphlet. But um, she was in 34 foster homes before her big sister. And then she was in the next foster home for four years. And so really, it, one of our outcomes is it helps kids get along better with adults and with parents. So we see that. And I think um, power Powerhouse has said the same thing with that, their program, that they see a lot more stability in foster homes. It's also a real safety net if kids go back to the family. Often, if there is reoccurrence of abuse, it's the big brother or big sister that finds out about it, and we're able to contact DHS pretty quickly. So I, th I think we're, it's great at having someone that's stable and will be with the child longer than the foster care workers or mm -hmm. the foster homes or um, probably anybody in their life. Do you have plans to start? You have mentioned that you might start tracking something like that because before you were kind of funded in, in the mentoring where those were some of the outcomes we were looking at. Now we're very specific in the foster care area. Um, so we were funded for this the last time right. as well. But um, no, I'm saying we could look at that. We have a lot of anecdotal information, but we're not yeah. tracking that. But I'm sure we could, especially... Um, I think some of that would be getting the information from DHS. Mm -hmm. And um, since they are the guardians of the kids, we're always working closely with them anyway. Any other questions of Lynn? Thanks, Lynn. Thank you. Yeah, I too actually um, had to recommend just a lower amount because I do recognize the importance of having supplemental resources for the students. Um, having that mentor, someone that's there consistently with them, someone who is volunteering their time, so that's something that they are desiring to do, not an obligation. Um, but then I also had to look at, again, distributing some of the funds and looking at the programs that were offering kind of a, um, a holistic, you know, more services than just one. And so I did have to reduce it also to 350, but also, one, def definitely valuing the, the importance of that student or that child having a mentorship okay. with someone. Oh, so there's three of us who recommended basically the 402. 952. 952, and then two recommending 350. Does anybody here want to change their recommendation? Okay. I think then we'll, then we'll go move ahead. ahead. Okay. So 402, 952 for Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Yes. Okay. Okay, moving on down the list. Um, do we want to do a check-in with the remaining amount or? There's good. Okay. Um, Impact Northwest is the next application uh, where three of you agreed on the same on the funding level, um, but there's a broader range here: 522, 991, up to 944, 321, which I believe is the full funding requested. Um, this program will provide supports and services for children, biological parents, and foster parents, including developmental screenings, home visits, parent-child interaction groups, mental health therapy, case <coughs> management, and support for foster parents and biological parents. Serving children ages zero to five, um, anticipate serving 36 children and families per year, and all referrals would come from DHS Child Welfare, the Alberta and Midtown branches. Um, um, there was um, some concerns expressed by staff about uh, master's level interns being used instead of li licensed professionals providing the mental health services for such a high risk population. And that was a question that came up um, from staff as well as uh, the reviewers on the panel that reviewed this application just uh, wanting more information about what level of supervision and who would be providing the supervision of those students um, and why it was selected to use students versus um, professionals. Do we have somebody from Impact Northwest here? Yes, yes we do. Welcome. 
you could just uh, give us your name and, and did you hear the, the question? Yes, I did. My name is Rachel Spiegel. Uh, we decided to use the uh, students from the Community Counseling Center for cost reasons uh, so that we could provide more services to more people. The students are highly supervised. Uh, sessions with uh, clients are recorded and reviewed with uh, a licensed uh, counselor on a weekly basis. Do you believe it's, it's an appropriate staffing arrangement given the high risk of... Of the Given the kids. high level of supervision, yes. Uh, these are people who um, will have training specific to the risks and needs of the population that we'll be working with, as opposed to maybe somebody out in the community who we might contract with who might not have training specific to the needs of the population we'll be working with. Any other questions of impact? Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a, I think, again, there's three of us who have recommended... Uh, 522-991, which I believe was a staff recommendation. Correct. Dan, I, just a quick question. Yep. Lisa, you've already checked all these for our guidelines on percentage of budgets. Of what? Correct. That's something that okay. John John's, has done. That's John's job. Right. Yes. They're all good. <laughs> these are, it's, it gets confusing because these are three-year amounts. So we compare a one-year, we compare one-third against an annual budget. Can't be more than 30%. No, uh, nobody on this slide is even close. Okay. So I, go ahead. Uh, please, Alyssa, go ahead. Well, okay. We both came in higher, so go ahead and you start. Okay. I, I was just going to say uh, you know, why I was a little bit out of whack here on the high end. Uh, this was uh, the only one that we're funding that really looks at the early childhood. The others were for adolescents and school-age children. Uh, and acknowledging that a big uh, piece of the issue is early childhood, I wanted to make sure that there was an effort to uh, show balance in that regard. Yeah, I did it for that reason, too. Um, the areas that they're going to be working were um, areas that were considered a high need by um, child welfare. I liked the coordinated approach with developmental screenings for the kids, home visits while in foster care and supporting and upon uni reunification parent-child interaction groups, mental health therapy, biological parents receiving intensive support services, case management, parent-child interaction groups. You know, the whole variety, this kind of integrated approach um, is, is one that I think is really called for in this area. And again, the zero to six population is just so key to the bonding and attachments that are formed during that age. Just want to add that this was the last um, application that staff in the staff recommendations, and so the funding level was determined based on how much funds remained at the point that I got to this application. I was actually concerned that there needed to be more funds um, for this program and would actually uh, need to know how the program could scale differently, what services would be um, either take reduced or fewer number of children served. Um, so actually it was a concern of mine. Um, but it was the last one that I got to. So um, it's not a matter of I thought they should receive less. It's just I had no more money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what would you recommend? Um, well, I would... It hadn't have been last. I would recommend a, a higher level of funding for this, and given that um, Emanuel Children's Hospital has a lower level of funding at this point, I would um, move closer to the full amount of funding, if not full funding. I would go there for the same kinds of reasons. I think the young children um, haven't been as well represented in the applic other applications that are on the slate, especially the staff slate. Um, and it looks like a very solid proposal. They um, had evidence of strong working relationships with DHS Child Welfare, and um, it was a very comprehensive program and I think could really benefit kids in, that are in foster care. Um, well, we've heard some pretty compelling reasons to consider a higher amount. Uh, I guess I'd be willing to increase from the staff's recommendation of 522, maybe up to uh, 700, 750. Let's toss that out for consideration. And I would come down to that level if somebody else would join us. 
Yeah, seven fifty. Yeah. Seven fifty. Real okay. It's nodding. Okay. Okay. So seven hundred fifty thousand. Okay. Um, then the the last application that has th all five of you in agreement that it should be funded at some level, um, three at a level of seven hundred and fifty thousand, one at five hundred thousand, and the other at six hundred and twenty-five is the SEI proposal. This is a culturally specific program serving African American children and youth living in North and Northeast Portland. Services include intensive academic support, case management, after school and summer programming, support for parents, foster parents, and post high school support for children transitioning out of foster care. Um, they propose to serve children and youth ages 7 through 24, estimate serving 60 children and youth each year, and the primary source of referrals for the program is Portland Public Schools. Staff had recommended um, a funding level of 500,000 um, because in this funding area, the RFI states that funding is for children or youth in foster care or transitioning out of foster care, and the applicant specifically um, lists serving a third of the of the children would be at risk of foster care placement. And while that's an important it's service, not it's not in compliance with um, the funding guidelines. It would actually fit within the child abuse prevention intervention funding area. Um, so alternatives could be if a higher amount of funding was is recommended by the committee to look at increasing the number of children that actually are in foster care that are being served through the program. So if in the case of full funding, um, which is recommended by of the allocation committee members, then um, I would encourage that we look to ask the applicant to serve 60 youth each year that are in foster care. So, yeah. just want to make sure I understand. So, if you're saying full funding, we need to hear from SEI that it will be all youth who are in foster care, not, not, not the two third thirds in foster care and, and one third, third at, at risk. risk of foster care placement. And that's 60. Correct. And 60. that's 60. As the proposal is written, it's 60 youth total, 40 who are in foster care, and 20 who are at risk of foster care placement. Do we want to hear from uh, I think it would be great to hear from them. I came in, um, I, again, in the middle of the range here because I felt that it was really important to support culturally specific organizations for, to serve foster kids who are disproportionately represented. So I wanted to go to the higher amount, but I saw... Um, two different rationales from people, from others, who are suggesting the full amount. One was, okay, go for the full amount, but it has to all be for foster kids. Increase that number to 60. And the other was um, that, that the person thought it was fine that we end up, try, that we serve those 20 before they fall into foster care because one of the recommendations from the multidisciplinary task force is to reduce Permanency. So do we really want to chop up everything into this is the child abuse over here? I think that's something for us after we finish the whole process to really look at in terms of the foster care arena. You know, where are we too restrictive by saying we're not going to be supporting any programs in the foster care category that are trying to prevent kids from falling into it? So that's a question for us later. But the reason I came in in a, in a middle number is because um, in this case, I wondered if startup was going to be an issue because they hadn't planned. They, they hadn't put that in their business plan that they have 60 kids or, or uh, identified or sources that they could easily, you know, like why wouldn't they have 60 if there were 60 out there that they thought they could um, reach? So that would be something I would love to hear from SEI. Do we have anybody from SEI here? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Welcome. If you could just uh, give us your name and then. Uh, Tony Hobson, President and CEO of Self Enhancement Inc. Uh, so, which one of the questions do, do you want me to start? Because the, the guidelines, whether they're the correct guidelines or not, that we said was that the kids had to be in foster care currently and not, um, as you proposed, yeah. preventing them from falling into foster care, even though that's very laudable. It's yeah. the child abuse, and you know we've made these artificial definitions. So, if we said we would do the full funding for 60 kids in foster care, do you feel that you could you know, certainly, do that from the start? Uh, yeah, certainly. It's not a problem. We chose 
to, to tackle it in the manner in which we did based on the prevention side of this because there's going to always be foster care children unless we can prevent kids from falling into that and we have a full cadre of services on our family enhancement side uh, and a contract with the state that works with families in hopes that we can keep those families intact so those kids won't fall into the foster care system. So, so we're always of the mindset that you go to the source of the problem and provide services there, but go back in the front end to see what are the conditions that's causing that and try to do some work there as well. If, in fact, the body wishes us to not go that route and choose 20 additional kids that are already in the system, that's not a problem. We have more than enough kids that mm. fit the category. Any other questions, Tony? Thanks. So I think uh, the question before us is to go with the full funding. I would be supportive of the full funding if it was the stipulation that it only served children currently in foster care. I mean, I think we set that out in our request for investment. I'm trying to think back to the ballot language myself, and I don't recall it exactly, but I think we set a pretty high standard of serving foster children in foster care, not to say that preventing children in foster care is not a laudable effort, and many of our other investments do get to that program, but I think to be consistent with what we asked of those who proposed here, we should either go with the full funding of 750 and 60 children in foster care or perhaps uh, Alyssa's lower amount of 650. Could I jump in on a, sure. a, a point? I, I'd like to fully fund it, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I'm looking at some data here from the National Data Archive on Child Abuse and Neglect, and one of the unfortunate things about the data for the state of Oregon is that there are 41 children of African American, uh, 41 African American children per thousand uh, in the population that are currently in an out-of-home arrangement. Uh, and that 41 puts us near the top nationwide. Uh, quick, dirty look here, it puts us in second place nationwide. Uh, keep in mind that in the state of Oregon, African American children tend to be consolidated in our community. Uh, these numbers are actually underrepresenting the issue uh, in terms of our community. It's going to be much, much higher. Uh, it's significantly higher uh, than uh, in the state of Washington. In fact, it appears that the rate is at least twice that of the state of Washington, more than twice the rate of Idaho, uh, and commensurate with the state of California, but we're still higher on a per capita basis. Uh, and again, I think this overrepresents the issue or, or understates the significance of the issue here in our local community. Um, so uh, there's no question that with the children currently in foster care, there's a significant service need that's not being met. So I would recommend the full amount, and I would recommend the stipulation that Commissioner Saltzman has proposed. And I would also recommend the full amount. When you look at just the fact that SEI is the only organization that's culturally specific delivering these resources to these kids that with, with people that look like them, that have their same culture, that's critical. And I would recommend the same stipulation, but definitely at the full, full funding amount. Yeah, I support the full funding too. Though my only decrease was we're asking them to do something they hadn't already proposed, so was there a lag in startup time? But I'm confident that um, they can take it on. Okay, so there seems to be consensus uh, 750,000 750, with the stipulation that it only be uh, used for children currently in foster care. <coughs> Great. Um, so then we move to the next um, level, or the next application to consider is the NEA proposal. And this is a culturally specific program for Native American youth and their foster and biological families. Services include case management, education and support, enrichment services, foster parent recruitment, and support. Serving children, age, children and youth ages 0 through 24 anticipate serving 275 each year. The primary, resource, the primary source for referrals for this program will be DHS Child Welfare, also from national and local tribes and other organizations. The staff recommendation is for full funding. Um, let me see. I believe two... Let's see. Hang on, let me look at my notes here. Too many pieces of paper. Um, one, two allocation committee members have agreed with the amount of 
one million five hundred seventy seven thousand five hundred ninety four um, th and that's the high end of the range the low end of the range is one million seventy seven thousand five hundred ninety four with two of the other allocation recommendations in between those ranges um, and staff the recommendation was for full funding because this is um, addressing an overrepresented population in the child welfare system like the African-American um, proposal just before this and staff has very high priority on services for these two culturally specific populations um, because of the overrepresentation issue. Um, so so that's some discussion. Lisa, I guess the the one thing I'm having second thoughts about this is not the need, but I think historically we've had trouble with startups, and we talked a little bit about, well, we didn't question some of the other ones, but this is one of the, the bigger grants you know, in, in all of the areas that we've looked at, and it's not a renewal like a lot of the other larger mm -hmm. grants that we've had, so it's not a program that's been ongoing, but it's zero to 275 plus the staff to go along with it. So and that's the, my concern is that we're going to be able to really fund this amount of money that quickly um, for the full request. And um, in the staff consideration of this proposal, um, really did consider startup costs and not thinking that they would be able to use the full amount of funding in the first year. Um, but a couple of concerns came up during the review of this application with the review panel. One was that the anticipated... Um, ratio of staff to the youth involved um, in the program was that reviewers felt like the number was too, the ratio was too high and so that um, really that ratio should be lowered significantly and to do that would cost more money. Um, also in the review of the application was that um, some of the reviewers felt that to really do the foster care recruitment um, for the population is going to take a lot of work and um, and you know reviewers felt like the applicant was very capable of doing that work but that it may take more effort than they're envisioning so while some of the other applications um, were startup and and staff recommended some cost um, reduction because of that in this case um, actually feel like the services are going to cost more than have been um, identified here. So that was the reasoning unless for we, that. Well, unless we decrease the scope of youth to be served. Right, decrease the scope. If, it, if fewer um, children and families were served through this, then it could be reduced. Um, but again, it just went back to the staff priority of serving, um, providing culturally specific services for African American and Native American um, children. So um, I wanted to put in a plug for the full amount. I know, Ted, you came up with some numbers before, and in the actually Impact Northwest proposal, there's a graph here that's um, by DHS as of December 2007 for Multnomah County. And whereas Caucasian, Hispanic, Latino, and Asian youth are underrepresented, in other words, they're, the number of kids in foster care, are, the percentage of them are less than in the general population, for African American, the Multnomah County population for African American is 9.5, and yet the youth in foster care is 19.4. That's a two to one ratio. For Native American, the population is just under 1%. The population in foster care is 22%. That's 22 to one. This is the only group that's culturally specific that's offering culturally specific. Um, services and I think that you ask a fair question and you know it, it is the largest grant out there I think I would hate to see the scope lessened because we're making an assumption about capacity and it might be appropriate to invite someone from NEA up to address that issue I just want to while we're waiting for that draw your attention to the spreadsheet there's 1.5 left and you yeah, and I guess see I you know in all honesty I'm a little concerned at this point because if we do the full funding that there's still a couple other proposals I want to hopefully get to, um, Children Relief Nursery and Kinship House. But listen to have uh, Nicole Meyer come up and respond to the question about decreasing the scope or any other 
questions. Just um, give us your name. Yeah. Good. Nicole Maher, Executive Director of NAIA Family Center. Thank you for inviting me up here. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, first of all, I want to say, while this would be a startup initiative through Children's Investment Fund, this is something that we have an ongoing track record of very successfully partnering with DHS. We currently are the statewide ILP provider. Um, we also currently do 4E services with the state and have a very positive working relationship. We literally have hundreds of children on our waiting list waiting for this service, um, looking for resources, looking for these exact activities. And I certainly can empathize and understand while it may look like a very large amount of money that we're asking for, we're simply asking for the amount of money it, that is representative of our representation in the foster care system. So while we're 22% of all children in foster care, after one year, we're 33% of all children in foster care. And after two years, we're 35% of all children in foster care. So we're, um, we recognize it may look like a large amount, but we are a very large population, incredibly overrepresented in foster care. And we definitely have a program that is up and running. This would just fund us and allow us to meet the need that has already been overwhelmingly expressed by the community. Any other questions? So how many staff do you see hiring? Well, we certainly would be open to talking with the CHIF staff if they believe a different staffing model might be important. Um, but we do have very highly qualified staff. We have the largest number of Native American MSWs employed by our organization. And we did not take this proposal lightly and have been very thoughtful about being very prepared, coming up with a plan in order to immediately be able to implement. So if there were suggestions, we would be open to that. But um, at this point, without hearing specifically what different staffing plan CHIF would like to see, we would. Um, go with the staffing plan that we see. We're, we're still advocating for, for full funding. We believe that that is what is fair and equitable considering our high numbers in the foster care system. So do you want a, a direct number of the five staff that we proposed? Or, no, I mean, okay. okay. Thanks. No, thanks, Nicole. Uh, well, I guess I'm, I'm, my recommendation was to fund it at... Uh, little over a million dollars and when I look to see how much money we have left at this point I'm convinced even more of the wisdom of that recommendation given that I want to get the two other proposals so so uh, we have the uh, should we I mean one idea is to go and look at the other two proposals and then come mm -hmm. back since there's not unanimity on whether to fund those or not so that would be one suggestion to do that mm -hmm. okay so that? we'll Set, set the okay. NIA consideration aside for a minute. Well, I, I, I guess I have an objection because um, I'd like to fully fund NIA. If we're going to go back and look at one, let's go back and look at Emanuel Children's Hospital because that's the one where we had more disagreement. Uh, you know, that uh, a Native American child is 10 times more likely to be in the foster care system than uh, a white child. I don't think that's right. And I, from my perspective, funding NIA. Uh, as a culturally specific provider that can help us get at that issue is, uh, in my mind, more important uh, than the proposal. I, we have to prioritize. This is a zero-sum game. I would prioritize that over the Emanuel proposal. Well, I, I, I don't, and I stand by my recommendation of a million dollars for now. Dan, I'd go along with your recommendation. Actually came in a little bit less than the full amount at fourteen eighteen. Um, just looking at what I was distributing, uh, but I, I do agree with it being a culturally specific organization. The fact that Native Americans are such a small portion of the Oregon population. This is when DHS came in to give us their feedback. They were saying African Americans and Native Americans are overrepresented. So this is where we can demonstrate to these um, two populations that we took seriously. Uh, the recommendations that came before us. And so um, I would actually agree with Ted in looking at the manual hospital, even though I know it's really um, those are services that are needed, especially with health in the community. And if you don't have your health, you really can't do many other things. Um, so I would be open to looking both at that and then, of course, the two that are still on the table. Well, and I would point out the two that are still on the table also serve African American and mm -hmm. Native American uh, youth foster care. So how would you like to proceed? Um, I would suggest, and I'm open to suggestion here, that we 
look at the the other two proposals for which at least three or more members have uh, suggested, and then we can revisit Naya and Emmanuel, or we can do a motion on Emmanuel or Naya. Could I propose a five-minute break? Okay. It's been proposed a five-minute break. Is there agreement on that? Mm -hmm. So it's 3.50 or 3.55? We'll come back at 4 o'clock. Thank you, Dan. That's one of
to reconvene. Um, so I think um, well, it's time to further discuss how we proceed from this point. We're getting down to the bottom here, or down to the end, I should say. Um, we still have um, Native American Family Center and the requested funding amount. I know there's been some discussion amongst members here. Does anybody... And we, I think we all, I think there's agreement, at least among uh, four of us, we want to get to the, uh, at least the Children's Relief Nursery proposal as well. Um, so, okay. So, it's so again, I, I'm, as I proposed earlier, I'm proposing about, you know, 1.1 million for NEA and that we use... Uh, the balance of that to consider the relief nursery. That's that's my proposal. I think there may be others. Or Chair Wheeler submitted a proposal to, I guess, take it out of the Emanuel proposal. Well, I, I hate to go back to the beginning because that's that would retie the Gordian knot uh, if we go back. Yeah. Um, so I, I I guess you know from my perspective as I look at the my own slate. Uh, the NIA proposal was very important to me, just based on the obvious need, uh, the ability, the organization, I believe, to deliver uh, you know so I, I guess we can hear the other two. Um, I, I'm not really sure how to proceed, except to say that in terms of my priorities and my list of priorities, NAO is right at the top of my list of priorities. And uh, the if other. There were, oh, go ahead. Go sorry, ahead. go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask the other three allocation committee members how they would like to proceed so we can get yeah. um, movement forward. Let's hear from the other to, three. I'm yeah. sorry, I wasn't what? trying to cut you off. I, I don't understand why I'm talking because I don't have a good solution <laughs> for this. <laughs> I have a suggested solution. I, I kind of feel bad for the ones that we consider at the very end because just because they happen to be at the end. So I actually think it would be fair to l talk about Children's Relief Nursery put in a number that we feel fair, um, either put in, I would put in the full amount for NEA and then decide where we want to, where we want to cut back would be one way to do it. Um, because again, NEA came at the bottom and so it's like, oh, well, that's all we have left and so that's what we'll give. I don't, I don't want to see us make a decision. I'd rather have us put in the amount. We've, we've, we had the liberty of doing that in the first few groups. We put the amount that we thought was appropriate based on what they asked, on the staff recommendation. We gave our rationale. So I feel that we should continue to do that for the other two. And when the numbers don't add up, go back and shave off. And it's really hard, I recognize, for groups here who think they're coming out of here with a certain number to perhaps then be shaved back. But I, I, it's, it's an imperfect system. I don't know how else to approach it. That makes sense to me. I would agree with that. In the for me, um, the organizations that I would look at, look at them, and I say this, it is unfortunately, this is really difficult, but the big brothers, big sisters, again, because again, it's, it's one area of support, the mentorship, um, <coughs> where it's important, but then when I look at, again, the overrepresentation of Native Americans in the system, we need to address that, that issue. And then um, the Emanuel Children's Hospital, but I would agree with Alyssa. Okay. Ron, you got any words well, of advice? I I'm still with you pretty close, Dan. I, I'd, I'd like to see us go with almost the full amount of NEA. I think it's very important, too. I think we'll be back here, and, and they probably won't be able to earn their full amount if we go the full amount. It's very difficult, as we've seen, to go uh, with that amount of money and gear up that much. So I'd propose that we go 200000 with the relief nursery and then the remainder with NEA. 
which would be a million five one four zero twenty seven. Does that work? So say the amount again for for the Native American Family Center. Uh, that would be one three one four zero two seven. With two, so out of the one five one four zero two seven remaining, two hundred goes to the relief nursery. The remainder goes to Nea. It works for me. So I, I think I heard Alyssa's proposal that to decide a <clears throat> preliminary amount for Native American Family Center, and then proceed to the other two. Um, Applicants that are on the list, well, I think, and then go back and yeah. award a preliminary amount to each of those, and go back then and adjust um, to take care of any overage. So that I think that was the discussion, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think at this point, Kenship House does not have uh, the critical amount of support on this committee to consider it uh, as much as I would like to consider it. I don't think it has <coughs> support from other members, or at least three other members to proceed. So I think we might be belaboring the point rather than just maybe taking Ron's idea. Well, but first of all, on the Children's Relief Nursery, um, I had them for 224298 which I think was the staff recommendation or the full request. Um, two were at that level, two were at 175 um, I would be willing to do 200000 because I'm finding it so hard to figure out where to shave. I do think it's really important that they be a part of the mix because they are the group that really is focused and has the expertise in trauma-affected children and families. They're tied into other children's relief nurseries. They do a lot of the training for other groups, um, DHS and others in town around trauma. So I, I think it's critical that they be a part of... Um, a part of the mix here, and I would be willing to do two hundred thousand. Um, I after that point, you know, I still feel that Naya should have the full funding and would prefer to see it shaved off from other places. Okay, well, I think we're at the point where we should probably we should should vote. Um, at this point, I mean, I think if if Ron moves the proposal, I will second it. We can vote on that, and then if we don't reach consensus, we'll go back and, and revisit another way to get at this. Ron, why don't you Okay, so my motion the is that we fund almost all of NAIA, shaving a little bit off of their request, so that they would have $1,314,027, and 200000 goes to the Children's Relief Nursery. I'll second that. <clears throat> so, if there's any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Okay. Motion fails. Well, I would be willing to put forward the idea of taking at least 50000 of that and putting it toward Nea as a start from Big Brothers Big Sisters, as Adrian said. I'm looking for little places. I recognize that Naya may not get all the full funding that I think it it needs to serve this community, but I'm looking for any little pieces here. I would just add to that the Children's Relief Nursery at the level that two of us recommended at 175. Okay, so you're suggesting 50 from Big Brothers Big Sisters to apply towards Naya. Naya. So what would the number? We want to take it piece by piece here and. Put those in there. Mm -hmm. is, there. Is there enough support, in other words, to do that? Giving it to Nea from what base, I guess, of what? 50000 from Big Brothers Big Sisters to Nea. I'm trying to find Vera, if there's enough support to shave mm -hmm. off different pieces. Is that on top of the full funding of Nea? No, right now I'm okay. starting with the, the base that we have mm -hmm. and trying to see if there's categories that we can shift. So the number you see right now is for Nea is one point three. Is minus fifty from Big Brothers Big Sisters. Okay. Minus twenty five from Children's Relief. That leaves that out for Native American okay. families. So, if you're both making that motion in a second, then that sounds good. I, I move that we do that. I'll second. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so what we have, I'm sorry, just to clarify then, you would accept everything else that's on there as it's laid out right now in your motion. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Okay, um, moving and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, the motion uh, is accepted. <clears throat> And I think we have a draft slate. We will now uh, take public testimony on this draft slate before we do a final vote. Um, I will ask people, first of all, there's no need to thank us. Um, and no. we will have, uh, and we ask that only one representative per organization uh, testify. How many people wish to testify? One, two. Okay, so we have about three or four. Uh, why don't we bring you up? Um, let's bring you up two at a time. So if, if two of you could come on up and we'll give you each um, up to three minutes. There is a timer there. Okay, I see. Okay, you're going to go first. And how about these two first? Actually, we can fit three. Uh, I guess we'll do two minutes. Yeah. So if you could just give us your name, uh, organization, and you each have two minutes, there's a timer in front of you that will be starting right now. Why don't we start with, with you in the center here. Hi, my name's Lauren Booth. I'm the executive director of the Children's Justice Alliance. And I uh, fully appreciate and respect the decisions that you've had to make, but would love this opportunity just to highlight some statistics from our proposed project. 41% um, I, sh I should say, uh, you're still welcome to your two minutes, but we have actually your proposal will come up next week under child abuse prevention. Well, we were being categorized under both. Right. So go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted you to know that <laughs> the reason it wasn't discussion of it today is, is for that reason. But okay, well, and that's, go ahead. that is good to know. I figured today I would address it from the foster care standpoint, just since that we're also being considered here today. 41% um, of Oregon children in foster care have a parent or caregiver who is a convicted felon. And more than half of all of Multnomah County's child welfare cases are in the East Portland service area that we provide service for from our Rockwood Center for Family Success. And one in 25 adults in that area are involved in the criminal justice system. Um, our proposed project would serve 100 families who are both criminal justice involved and also child welfare involved. And we have a proven track record with working with families who are in foster care. Nearly half of the clients that we've served in our existing program who didn't have their kids in their custody were able to regain custody of their children while working with us at the Center for Family Success. We already uh, partner closely with DHS at the local level where caseworkers refer clients and, and work with our staff on client needs. Um, but also with the state level of DHS, we're funded for our Parenting Inside Out curriculum, which is approved for child welfare clients. Um, without this funding for our ongoing services, many of these kids are going to cycle in and out of the foster care system multiple times while their parents cycle in and out of um, Go ahead and the children's finish. justice uh, or the justice system. Um, so that our services are in high demand for child welfare. We already serve families in foster care and we hope that as you stated if we're not funded through this category that will be strongly considered in the child abuse prevention category. My name is Kristen Harper, and I am with Boys and Girls Aid Mentor Portland. I'm here to ask you to reconsider the funding recommendation for mentoring for youth in foster care. Recent research in the field of mentoring tells us that while mentoring has great potential to positively impact the lives of youth, mentoring that is not successful or mentoring that is done to reach high numbers of matches without providing necessary training or support for volunteer, volunteer mentors can actually add further damage to youth in foster care. Successful mentoring, mentoring that yields concrete positive outcomes for youth in foster care, must be provided with a foundational knowledge of attachment theory and child welfare. Boys and Girls Aid has been providing high quality mentoring services for the past three years. 
um, to youth in foster care specifically. Our match support specialists provide support to no more than um, 40 mentors. So our ratio is one to 40 at the highest. And we also have staff, separate staff, who do recruitment and, and interview screen um, new mentors um, and so on. Um, we provide intensive training to volunteers around attachment theory, around working with um, youth in foster care and working with the system. We have a strong relationship with DHS uh, and with individual caseworkers that allow us to track when youth in foster care are moved from home to home and maintain those long-term mentoring relationships. We know that um, strong relationships with positive adults are absolutely critical for youth who have experienced a lot of disruptions in their attachments with adults already in their young life. And so that's why it's so important that these kinds of services are, are provided carefully and um, through an organization that really has a strong understanding of attachment theory. Thank you. Thank you both. Who's next? Lynn and uh, Ann? Again, if you can just give us your name and organization, you'll have uh, Hi. two minutes and it's right there in front of you. Okay. Hi, I'm Lynn Thompson again from Big Brothers Big Sisters. I understand you need to shave some money off, um, but I'm a surprise it's all from one agency. This amount would put us at lower than what CHIF funded us at before, and we got very high results, and you're not looking at other mentoring programs. There's a lot of research coming out now that mentoring is very, very successful and important for kids in foster care. In fact, um, family, um, Casey Family Center says it's the most important thing a community can do for a child. As I say, you know, I can't give kids in foster care someone to tuck them into bed at night, and a lot of that do not get that in the placements they're in, but I can at least give them something to look forward to once a week, and that volunteers are often the only loving person who's showing them um, new ways to do things. And in terms of that's the only service we provide, M most of our kids get wraparound services from all of our partnerships that volunteer mentors as well as our staff put kids up to summer camps after school programs we have educational activities cultural activities we just don't have the room and the chief grant to elaborate on all of that um, and just you know one quick example we had a boy a native american boy who was um, his mom was drug addicted. He got in our program when she went to prison, and then she came out, and he was in foster care. Well, he was while she was in prison and for a while. But when she got clean, got him back, shortly after that, she was diagnosed with um, terminal cancer. And actually, um, I, I misspoke. That's when she got him into our program because she said, you know, my I have not one family member in the world, and my son's going to go back in the foster care system, and there'll be no one there just for him, and I want him to have a big brother. And she wanted him to have someone who knew his mom and before she died as well. So I just hope you reconsider giving kids one person who will stay with them throughout their experience. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ann Witzel. I'm Executive Director of Kinship House, and I just wanted to lobby again for reconsideration of funding for Kinship House. This is our first time to apply to the SHIFT program, and really thrilled to do that. We have a program that began in 1995, and it is um, extremely well tested. Uh, we have um, licensed clinicians who have been with us on an average of eight years, which is phenomenal in this field. And the clinicians are all highly experienced and well-educated. Kinship House is very small. We're in a very home-like facility just off Broadway on Northeast 8th. We serve about 300 children a year. And these are kids that are highly traumatized and uh, with post-traumatic stress disorder and behavioral attachment disorders. We work with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis, on an outpatient um, basis, and we work with all the kins and family members around them, foster, biological, adoptive, so that the children, the, when they leave our program, it's a successful transition to permanency, whether it's back to biological or to a permanent foster or adoptive, and our outcomes are extraordinary. So 
we really highly feel that um, having a program with licensed clinicians who are experienced is the only way to go with kids who have been so traumatized. Our track record proves that. And uh, we hope that you might reconsider funding us this time around. We'd love to be part of this program. And I might say that we have um, our, we serve children from all backgrounds, and one of the approaches we take is to uh, honor the heritages of these, these diverse heritage of kids, multiracial and from all different backgrounds. We currently serve over 20% African American, um, about 6 to 8% Hispanic on the average, and Native American, uh, about 20% of our, of our young clients are from um, Native American heritage. So our approach is to look at the uniqueness of each child and develop a treatment plan that's unique to them and work towards permanency and success. So thank you for considering that opportunity. Thank you, Anne. Uh, anybody else wish to testify? Okay. Okay, so that completes our testimony and we're now at the point of uh, making any modifications to the draft slate or voting to make the draft slate the final slate of funding recommendations. So there's the preliminary slate in front of you. Are there motions at this point or more discussion? Drew, I forgot about more discussion. Okay. <laughs> Okay. I, I would move that we accept the, the slate. I second. Okay. Further comments? Sure. I, 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 I will vote to accept the slate. Um, this is a deliberative process, and it's a group process, and uh, there are obviously uh, a few issues where uh, I would not necessarily agree with the majority, but I think on the whole, uh, I, I just want to applaud my colleagues up here. Uh, I think they've worked very, very hard. There's been a lot of um, thoughtful uh, exchange, I thought, today. I thought the deliberation was very good. We had differences of opinion, but I just want to say how much I appreciate uh, the level of discourse that we have on this body. I think it's terrific, and I think the public benefits as a result. I want to thank the staff, too for your hard work. Um, I, I also want to add my uh, thanks to my colleagues. I've, uh, well, I've been on this uh, allocation committee for how many years? Seven years now? Six, okay. Um, and this is certainly the, uh, and Ron Bell's has been with me the whole time. I don't want to, <laughs> but I'm saying, I think even Ron's more prepared today and last week than <laughs> he was in the past. And I feel I was too, and I think certainly uh, my colleagues that haven't been here before are, very, are showing a very uh, high depth of, of homework and, and coming to these recommendations. Um, these recommendations are, are not easy. The only thing that's easy about them is that we are in fact investing more money into helping foster care kids as opposed to cutting money. That's what makes it easier. Um, and I do want to add, as I added after our after-school and mentoring uh, investments of two weeks ago, we often do find, due to favorable uh, appreciation of property and property values, that we may, in fact, have more money to invest than we are presently budgeting of about $15 million a year. And as we did last time around, uh, we did have another additional round in after-school and mentoring to invest some of those monies, and uh, I think there's a very good prospect if that scenario unfolds again, we would also revisit our other investment areas, including uh, the foster care. So while some organizations um, did not succeed today, I, I would say don't give up all hope. But I do again want to appreciate all the work that the organizations that have applied to us have put into good quality proposals, and thank you all for the work you're doing uh, for our children. Any other comments? Okay. All in favor of adopting the draft slate as the final slate of recommendations, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it passes. Uh, again, I also want to thank the staff. They did outstanding work. Our next meeting will be uh, 1 o'clock, Tuesday, June 9th, here in the council chambers, and we'll be voting on early childhood 
and child abuse prevention intervention recommendations. We stand adjourned. Right now? Because we always.